now. Um, hello and welcome. Um, for those of you who don't know me, um, my name is Fran McGinnity. I work at a research institute in Dublin, the Economic and Social Research Institute here. I work on equality and discrimination, on migrant integration, not surprisingly, childcare and work-life balance in Ireland and from a comparative perspective. Uh, mostly when Ireland is in there actually, so the comparisons of Ireland with um, other countries. I also manage an integration monitor um, in Ireland, which is similar to Settling In that uh, Laurent mentioned earlier, uh, the OECD publication, which uses LFS data, EU Silk data, administrative data um, in, in Ireland. And I have to say um, that it's very exciting to hear that the European Labour Force Survey will have both reasons for migration and uh, country of birth of parents. That's, uh, that's, that's really, um, that's really exciting, particularly in Ireland where there's no other uh, data source uh, with this information. Um, I'm also uh, finding it inspiring that uh, monitoring integration, migrant integration, is gaining momentum at, a, at, an, EU, uh, at an EU level. Um, so that uh, spurs us on to, um, to do the best we can in the, in the Irish exercise. And um, I suppose I'm also involved in some um, exercises in Ireland to improve the evidence base um, on both equality and integration from administrative data sources from different government departments in Ireland. And I completely agree with Thomas, uh, Thomas's point earlier about the, the crossover between uh, equality and integration data. So now today, I'm, I'm actually presenting uh, on something different. Um, it's work, joint work with a colleague from um, the Netherlands, um, Marova Hiesberts. Um, Marova has done quite a bit of work on sociocultural integration of immigrants um, in the Netherlands, yeah. where there's a longer tradition of um, research on immigrants and integration, uh, certainly than in Ireland, where um, immigration is um, a relatively new phenomenon and uh, I guess, well, the, the last two decades, but we're still developing, uh, we're developing the field. We did this work as part of a, a comparative project called Causes and Consequences of Sociocultural Integration Processes Among New Immigrants in Europe. Um, there's a logo here, this one here, the SKIP is the acronym. Um, so it was funded by the North Face Research Initiative and I was uh, co-leading the Irish uh, wave of, of uh, field work. The field work was done a number of years ago, forgive me for this, uh, between 2011 and 2013. And debates, uh, as particularly on this topic, have moved on since, particularly in the UK. Uh, but I think there may be still some uh, lessons uh, that, uh, that we can learn from this. Um, it's theoretically interesting uh, for many reasons to look at new uh, immigrants, um, but it's very challenging from a survey point of view. I, I have to say it's particularly challenging in a country like Ireland that doesn't have either a population register or even a migrant register. So um, I'm going to focus more on the results of, of these surveys today, but um, but I'm very happy to talk about um, all the challenges. So this won't be uh, news to many in the room, uh, the, the idea that uh, discrimination is both a problem for minority groups and for the societies they live in. It's related to um, their group identity, so to what extent they identify with their country of origin, to what extent they identify with their host country. It's also related to this notion of acculturation, that's their adaptation to the host country in terms of attitudes, for example, um, gay rights, um, divorce. And a, a motivation behind this paper is that if immigrants feel unfairly treated, badly treated, and retreat into separate identities, this can strain um, social cohesion. Social cohesion, uh, <clears throat> I know, has uh, much more formal definitions, but I see it as the sort of social glue 
that sticks um, societies together. So in terms of the innovations of this paper, I think it's fair to say that much research on discrimination has been about uh, racial and ethnic minorities, particularly in the United States. This paper is uh, unusual in exclusively focusing on East Europeans, uh, Polish migrants moving to Western Europe. Um, I hardly need to tell this audience that free movement of labour is central to uh, the European project. Um, uh, the, the other, I suppose, one other innovation is that, that it compares the same migrant group at around the same time in four different receiving country contexts. That's Ireland, the UK, the Netherlands and Germany. So the idea is to investigate uh, new immigrants uh, fresh off the boat. That's not really in Ireland, it's definitely fresh off the, the, the aeroplane. Uh, ones who have like a blank slate. I think the boat idea came from uh, the, the US New Immigrants Survey that this is closely uh, based on. And then uh, once they've arrived in their destination country to track uh, their experiences 18 months later. So it is a, um, it is a panel survey. What do we mean by a threat in the air? This is um, the notion that um, of, of perceived group discrimination. So this is immigrants perce perceiving that their group is, is discriminated against. It's um, essentially an attitude. Um, all of the questionnaires in the four countries were in Polish. This is the translation uh, in Ireland of the, uh, the Polish questionnaire, so some say that people from Poland are being discriminated against in Ireland or the Netherlands or Germany, the UK. How often do you think uh, Polish people are discriminated against in, in this case, in Ireland? So it's related to immigrants' personal experience in their, um, in their, in their host country, in their destination country, but also reflects that notion of a threat in the air, a sort of ever-present threat that they, uh, that they feel. It varies with their personal characteristics and their experiences, not surprisingly, in their host country, but also uh, differences in the national context. I'll go a little faster through uh, this, as I think this um, <clears throat> theoretical backdrop will be familiar to many people here, this, uh, this notion that individuals uh, strive to achieve a sort of positive uh, social identity by, by comparing in-groups and out-groups. They selectively perceive characteristics, um, positive characteristics of their in-groups and negative characteristics of their out-groups. Um, uh, these stereotypes may be, may be true or false, but they will uh, influence, the, um, may influence the um, the behaviour of the group, um, and then I suppose some, some would argue that it's not so much the individual interactions, the sort of micro-scale social interactions, but these wide, widely held unfavourable stereotypes that will affect people's uh, perceived discrimination, their sense of belonging, and, and their, ultimately their, their well-being. A question becomes then, um, how do these boundaries develop? Who's, who, who's defined as an in-group and an out-group? Um, and in some European countries, the host population may be more concerned about linguistic or cultural identity. So um, non-racial social boundaries develop between, uh, in this case, white, uh, white Europeans. Of course, this... Um, the, the, this, this relationship and the perceptions of immigrants may differ depending on the extent of exposure in their, in their host country and obviously how long they've been living there. We're trying to catch new immigrants in the survey, but uh, this, uh, this will also vary. Um, and also, to what extent they engage with their host country? Do they? Do they? Uh, do they? Are they very much in their in their um, origin country bubble, 
or do they consume the culture of the, um, the country that they've migrated to? Uh, TV use we have here, I mean, it could be uh, websites, uh, might be, uh, <clears throat> might be more, more current. Their news consumption, do they read the newspapers of the country that they've moved to? Are they interested? Do they know anything about the political system of the country that they've moved to? Um, their, their language skills, um, how much are they, they getting, how much are they understanding about what's going on actually in the country and, and their, their social contacts uh, in, in, in various domains, although of course this can may be positive or negative. So we have an overall uh, expectation that, that the more exposed they are, this may be positively associated with uh, perceptions of, of discrimination. What about their exposure to other Poles, uh, other Polish migrants in the country that they've moved to? You know, we know that for new immigrants, contacts with co-ethnics or co-nationals um, are very important for, for getting jobs, for getting housing, for figuring out how things work. But this also might make immigrants more aware of discrimination against their group. So a second hypothesis we develop is that exposure and, uh, and, and, and sort of consumption of their origin culture, to what extent they're still almost there in, their, in, in Poland, will be positively associated with perceptions of discrimination. It may also, of course, be um, associated with their experience in the, in the host country, if they've, if, if they've really been turned down a job because they're a, they're a migrant or not, uh, not given housing, uh, then this uh, may, of course, contribute to the sense that their group is discriminated against. Of course, <laughs> I need to maybe speed up a little bit now, um, the country contexts really do differ. Um, the UK, Germany and the Netherlands, this is very much, uh, I'm sure people will, will disagree with this, but, but in very brief, have experienced substantial immigration since 1950. Ireland has experienced substantial immigration of non-Irish nationals since the mid-1990s. Polish immigration to the Netherlands, UK and Ireland was low until 2004, but following a session of, of Eastern Europe, the flows uh, were substantial, especially to um, the UK and Ireland. Uh, so, for example, in Ireland, by the 2011 uh, census of population, Polish nationals made up 2.7% of the Irish population, um, over, um, uh, <coughs> overtaking UK nationals, which had been the previous uh, largest group, uh, and, and also there were many in, uh, in England and Wales. Uh, the labour market situation, uh, of course, back then was also different. In 2011, unemployment in Ireland was 15%, much lower in uh, UK, Germany, and particularly the Netherlands. Quickly, um, and again, quite a lot has changed here in terms of the attitudinal climate. Uh, this is uh, 2011, uh, 2013, um, and <clears throat> there are many other references I could use here, but <clears throat> our idea is that, that anti-immigrant elites, be they uh, political actors or, or the media, um, and, and others in positions of power may, may play a role in persuading the, the public the, in the host country that anti-immigration is, is the answer. In Ireland, certainly, attitudes became more negative during the economic recession, which was uh, pretty catastrophic, uh, but perhaps not to polls. Uh, in the Netherlands, by contrast, uh, there's a much more negative social climate towards East Europeans, uh, the, the, or was the Radical Right Party. In the UK too, um, immigration, well I, I don't need to say this now, um, but it was contentious and highly salient. Uh, uh, EU immigration rose rapidly after the accession of the East European countries and growing support for UKIP. Obviously there have been many events uh, since then. Uh, Germany perhaps less negative attitudes towards Poles, uh, but then immigration from Poland is not so new. Uh, but uh, let's see, uh, this is really not, uh, this is not quite, um, so yeah. So, so then this is uh, our, our fourth hypothesis, are basically that the role of exposure um, and experiences might differ depending on the country and the, 
the, the high level national discourse, political and media, uh, certainly more negative in the UK and especially uh, the Netherlands. Um, so the, this, uh, um, the, the, the effect of exposure might depend on your, um, on your country, uh, or, or on the host country. So now, the SKIP survey <coughs> um, was funded by the North Face Research Programme on Migration. Uh, led by uh, Claudia Deal, um, who is in Göttingen now in Constance. It's a two-way panel study, as I mentioned, of selected migrant groups, uh, around 7,000 migrants in total, uh, aged, uh, working age 18 to, to 60 in the four countries. As I said, they were interviewed soon after arrival, and as many as possible, uh, 1.5, uh, a year and a half, about 18 months later. So, um, as I said at the outset, a survey of new immigrants is challenging. This is a dispersed population, diverse and highly mobile. Um, there, we had to use a variety of sampling methods. Um, ideally, we would have used the same method, but the research teams, not surprisingly, in the Netherlands and Germany, wanted to use migrant registers. Uh, there were some challenges here. In Ireland and the UK, there are no uh, migrant registers or population uh, um, registers, so we used um, respondent-driven sampling, um, which uh, was originally developed uh, in the United States for, <coughs> for drug-using communities. Um, we um, adapted it for, uh, for migrants. Um, it had worked well for a sample, an earlier study on Polish migrants in Ireland, but uh, we had um, even more challenges than the uh, Dutch and German teams in both Ireland and uh, the UK. Happy to talk about that uh, later if anybody's interested in the particular, um, particular challenges or how we address those uh, in Ireland. So now, in terms of just focusing on the Polish respondents, um, because this is the focus of the paper, in wave one then we had uh, around, there was, there was around a thousand in Ireland, you will immediately notice that while there are uh, reasonably high but variable numbers of Polish migrants in wave one, we got the substantial attrition uh, at, at, at wave two, so um, 18 months later. I should just say, in defence of the Irish team, <laughs> that um, actually there were, there were 400 um, <clears throat> Polish migrants still in Ireland uh, 18 months later, but we did also um, survey uh, another 200 who had returned back to, to Poland. So, I mean, uh, strictly speaking, the response rate then is, is, is a little bit higher. It's 613 were surveyed at the second wave. But for a paper like this, um, which is focusing on, the exper uh, on, on perceptions of discrimination then, uh, um, we only take those who were um, in Ireland, uh, in, in their um, the host country at the, um, at the second wave. So the fieldwork was, uh, Basically, wave one was 2011, and uh, wave two was uh, wave one plus 18 months, so sort of uh, late 2012, uh, 2013. So, okay. Research question. So this this core question: How often do you think Polish people are discriminated against in uh, country X? So here you see um, the blue bars at the bottom are are never. Almost never, we've got the big green, sometimes, purple is often, and this light blue is very often. So what's immediately apparent here is that uh, Polish migrants in the Netherlands uh, have much, uh, new Polish immigrants in the Netherlands report uh, this much more than in, um, than in the other countries. So how is this related to the composition? They're all new migrants, but in terms of their age and gender, are there different Polish migrants going to these different countries? Um, and how does it relate to their, um, their exposure and their, and, their, um, and their experience? So uh, this slide is on how we measure uh, these different elements, but uh, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll skip here. Uh, 
to show some models. Uh, this is just, um, so this is when we rescale this perceptions of discrimination on an index from one to five. You know, here just, uh, this is without any of the, of the um, <coughs> covariates we're interested in. It, it's quite clear that the migrants in the Netherlands, you know, they're, they're on average a half a point uh, higher. This is, uh, there's an OLS regression on this, on this index. In Germany also uh, somewhat higher. So when we, when we account for duration and exposure and also um, uh, compositional differences, there weren't so many compositional differences. These migrants were mostly young. Uh, they were mostly, um, they were more highly educated in Ireland than the UK, but uh, the, the compositional differences uh, didn't, make, uh, didn't make such a difference. Duration did. Uh, very disappointingly, uh, these exposure, uh, I'm not sure the coefficients, but uh, they didn't really have uh, any effect. So uh, that was a little bit of a, um, a disappointment, <laughs> especially for uh, Rova. So we, we, we don't, it, it, maybe the measures aren't, uh, aren't so good. Um, what we do find, this is the, this is the same models just on the, on, on the next page, is that this, this attack, <clears throat> attachment or rather behaviour, I suppose, with their co-ethnics, with other Poles. So the, the, the migrants who, who spent more time watching Polish TV, consuming Polish media and, and more social contacts with Poles, they have more of a sense that, they're, that, that Poles are discriminated against. Um, and then not surprisingly, their experience, uh, those who are uh, currently unemployed, there were plenty of them in Ireland, there were plenty of non poles who were unemployed in Ireland at the time too, but there were also uh, plenty of poles. So they, they, um, uh, this negative experience uh, increases their perceptions of, of uh, or sorry, being unemployed, and then also their negative experiences. So this was mostly I didn't get a job because of my uh, uh, my nationality or migrant status, but there were some others in there as well. They turned out for housing and and. Uh, and harassment. So what happens then, um, um, a, year, a year and a half later, you know, the, this early integration. So here, it's the same colours as before, and um, we have Ireland with one, with two, Netherlands with one, with two. So you can see here, um, actually, um, of respondents' presence at both waves, we did some checks because there was so much attrition. Um, I can talk about those two. Actually, Poles in Ireland uh, were, 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 were feeling, uh, were, were less likely, certainly, uh, they, they, um, they were less likely to perceive discrimination against their group. The opposite happened um, in the Netherlands, which uh, we have won already. A lot more of them uh, um, were perceiving discrimination against Poles, and this increased between wave one and wave two. Um, Germany actually, uh, th there wasn't so much change, but there was also a change in the UK between so 2011, 2013, where the Polish migrants then having <coughs> lived in the country for another year and a half felt more, uh, felt more discrimination. Oh God, I better move on here. Um, yeah, so what's the story uh, in terms of um, uh, the, the, this change over time? Yes, I mean, uh, this is just, uh, this shows that even, uh, even after a, a whole series of, of, uh, of controls that the, um, there's, there's other controls in here, but that uh, the experience of, of discrimination of Polish migrants in the Netherlands is higher, in Germany is higher, and the UK is also significantly higher than in Ireland, which uh, we, I chose <laughs> as a reference category. Um, it's um, a not, not so much uh, related to the, the duration, so this is the change in discrimination between wave one and wave two, it's not, not so uh, um, related to the duration of <coughs> wave one. Um, it, it's not quite what we expected for language ability, but uh, we can think of an explanation for this. So those who have better self-reported language skills of the country in which they're living in experience less discrimination. Um, so we thought maybe they'd be more sensitive to it if they had a better sense of what was going on, but perhaps they're just better integrated and uh, have more uh, 
positive experiences. We still have this effect of those who are still sort of continuing to, to consume their home country and media are somewhat more likely, though the effect is, is pretty small. And the, those who had this negative experience, that uh, the sort of personal experience of discrimination, uh, were more likely to perceive discrimination against the group. Those who had a sort of positive change and who had, expe you know, had negative experience between wave one and two also. And then uh, this, this, this was heightened in the, in the Netherlands. So having, having a negative experience, a change in negative experience, sorry, having a negative experience between wave one and wave two had more of an effect in the Netherlands than in the other countries. So um, yeah, so in terms of the summary, uh, I think uh, the takeaways, uh, so shortly after arrival, the uh, perceptions of discrimination among Polish migrants are higher in the Netherlands and somewhat higher in Germany than in Ireland. Um, this is still found after controlling for composition and <clears throat> exposure and experience. It's particularly related to duration and also uh, experience. Uh, we find greater increase in the Netherlands and the UK 18 months later than in Germany or Ireland. So um, whereas uh, having recently arrived in the Netherlands, uh, Polish migrants felt uh, this threat in the air that wasn't so much the case in the UK, but a year and a half later, they um, they, they 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 were reporting these these feelings. Um, I suppose, uh, yeah. So receiving uh, just in terms of future uh, work may differ uh, for different migrant groups. You know, uh, one strength of this paper is that it's uh, it's the same group in four different countries. But actually, then you might be asking. I mean, presumably. Uh, Muslim migrants will have a different experience from Polish migrants, uh, but um, there's no data. <laughs> uh, the, in the Irish uh, survey, there was only data for, uh, for Polish migrants. So uh, that's not to say you couldn't, <laughs> couldn't look at the other three countries. Um, and I, I suppose these perceptions, the, these findings uh, am, uh, among perceptions of discrimination and how, how Ultimately, how welcome Polish migrants feel suggests that free movement in Europe may be more of a challenge to social cohesion than many uh, Europeans would like to believe. Um, though the challenge does vary uh, across countries. Uh, I'll just leave that slide up. That's a, if you want to read more, this was part of a, a, of a, of a special issue. Um, and there's, there's many other themes in, in this comparative survey and uh, some, some of the colleagues on the team had done uh, have, have done other papers. I'm proud to say after the presentation yesterday that we that the data has been uh, archived at Gazes and it does have a DOI. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>